Um, in part because I was thinking about the rubric uh, for forming text, and in a way, what I'm going to talk about is the opposite, okay? Textualizing performances, taking performances and turning them into texts of one sort or another, written, photographic, uh, to some degree audiovisual, through acts of documentation. And I do want to give you just a little bit of context for all of this. Uh, I hate bullet points. I always tell my students not to use them. But on this occasion, I sort of felt it was the most efficient way of doing things. So one of the reasons why I became interested in this whole question of performance art documentation um, is because it, it's become a kind of hot topic in the worlds of art and performance art in recent years. And there are a number of different issues that kind of surround it. So I've identified just a few of them. The last one is really where I'm trying to go in, in this talk. Um, but um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons, I think, why this has become such a hot topic um, is because of um, a perception, let's say, of what can be called the ontology of performance. And uh, a certain attitude, which I've chosen a quotation from Peggy Phelan to represent here, performance cannot be saved, recorded, documented, or otherwise participate in the circulation of representations of representations, once it does so, it becomes something other than performance. Um, and so this, this, this way of thinking, uh, which is actually the dominant way of thinking uh, right now about performance and its documentation, really, I think, focuses obsessively on the relationship between the performance represented, this is all, of course, really crappy clip art, which I love to use, um, the performance over there uh, and the document, the relationship between those two things, okay, and particularly around ideas of fidelity, in a sense, to what degree can the document really be faithful to the original event, uh, to what degree can we get a sense of the nature of that original event from the documented form. And of course, the quotation from Peggy Phelan, and there are many, many people who share in this view, suggests that we can't, that this is a hopeless relationship, right? That in fact, performance cannot be documented. No documentation of performance can ever provide a sense of what that performance was like. Um, I do not agree with that, but in a sense that the, the larger discussion of that is a bit beyond the scope of what I'm gonna talk about today. I will say this much though, and that is that rather than focusing on the ontology of performance, and therefore the relationship between document and performance, and questions like whether performance in effect can be documented, I am more interested in what I'm calling the phenomenology of performance documentation, which is to say not the relationship between the document and the original event, but primarily the relationship between the audience that has some kind of experience of the performance from the document. Okay, so that's why the arrows go the way that they do. The audience, the audience's main interaction is with the document, and somehow through that, they have some kind of experience of the performance. Okay, and this is arranged as a hermeneutic circle. All right, for reasons again that I'm not going to go into right now. <laughs> um, so the second just sort of aspect of this, I think that I want to mention is the idea that performance art is mediated through documentation for the majority of its audience. Now, especially if you're talking about sort of historical performance art from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you're talking primarily about events that may only have happened once, okay, or some very small number of times. And in fact, may only have happened once for a very small audience. So the number of people who actually experience the real event is minuscule. And the vast majority of people who know anything about these performances know them through their documentation, by reading descriptions of them, perhaps scripts in some cases, looking at photographs, maybe looking at videos. Um, but you know, to, to a very, very significant extent, um, people who know this stuff know it primarily through documentation which again is part of what makes documentation sort of a fraught issue here, okay? Um, 
And then another thing that's kind of come on the horizon is the idea of performance art reenactment, of redoing historical performances. Okay? And this is, this is not a brand new idea, but it's become, it's sort of reached a, a kind of a fever pitch in the last few years. Um, and again, it's a very controversial practice. There were a lot of discussion and debate around it. Um, some people believing that you can't really redo the performance because you can't recreate the cultural context that surrounded it. So inevitably, it's going to be something different. Uh, some people thinking that you can't recreate the performance because uh, it's, it's so attached to the particular artist who did it the first time around that nobody else can do it meaningfully. Uh, and various other arguments um, and debates of that kind. Now, of course, if you are reenacting a performance, you are reenacting it from its documentation. That's where you get the information on which to base the reenactment. And so once again, documentation becomes a very important part, a very important uh, aspect of that practice as well, okay? Now, um, I've been working on this topic for, I would say, about five years now. And a lot of the work that I do around it is what I would describe as primarily theoretical or philosophical, okay? But the question also has a historical dimension, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, primarily. This presentation is sort of framed by more theoretical speculation, but in the middle is a fairly long, <laughs> you've been warned, narrative uh, of the history of performance documentation. And, and just to give you a, a little bit of a, of a trailer, um, I, in the midst of doing more sort of theoretical work on this than I do, and the theoretical work has a lot to do with this, discussing that phenomenological concept and the hermeneutic circle and how all that works. Um, but I also started thinking, you know, if you, just, if you just think about photography, people have been taking pictures of actors, dancers, performers since the invention of photography. Okay? But most of that stuff is not performance documentation. Performance documentation is a specific kind of practice that has certain objectives and that attempts to meet those objectives through certain approaches and methods. Okay? It is a specific discourse. It is not simply taking pictures of or recording performances. Right? And so therefore, there must have been a point at which this came into being, so to say, at which somebody came up with the idea of this thing called performance documentation and the practice that goes along with it. So that's what I was trying to get at here. I was basically trying to answer that question for myself. Where does all this come from? When did it start? Now, of course, you can't answer a question like that definitively or universally. So I chose to focus on one particular context with which I'm familiar, which is the New York art scene. Uh, the, the dates that I provided are from 1964 to 74, make a nice sort of package uh, it sounds like all this took place over a specific decade, but that's not really the case. And those, uh, those dates are somewhat fraudulent. Because um, really what I'm talking about, as you'll see, begins in the late 1950s and in some sense continues to the present day. So in an earlier essay of mine called The Performativity of Performance Documentation, I argued that performance documents in all media are not just records of performances that happened, but are themselves performative in Austin's most basic sense. So this is a passage from that essay. Speaking of language, Austin calls statements whose utterances constitutes action in itself performatives. The, the title of Austin's famous book is How to Do Things with Words. So the performative is a statement that actually does something by being stated, by being spoken. The classic, although extremely banal, example is saying, I do, in a marriage ceremony. Before you say that, you are not married. After you say it, you are. You become married by saying it. Right? So the, the speech act produces a change in the real world, so to speak. 
Distinguishing performative utterances, which do that, from constitutive utterances, which are basically descriptions of the world as it is, Austin argues that, quote, to utter a performative sentence is not to, I love the way, this is really twisted a sentence here, so Steve, try to follow with me. I love the way Austin puts these things. Austin argues that, quote, to utter a performative sentence is not to describe my doing of what I should be said in so uttering to be doing, or to state that I am doing it, it is to do it, end quote. If I may analogize the images that document performances with verbal statements, the traditional view sees performance documents as constatives that describe performances and state that they occurred. I am suggesting that performance documents are not analogous to constatives, but to performatives. In other words, the act of documenting an event as a performance is what constitutes it as such. Documentation does not simply generate images or statements that describe an autonomous performance and state that it occurred. It produces an event as a performance. That's the end of the quotation from the previous essay. So as an example, this is a piece by Vito Acconci called Trademarks, in which he basically, you can see him sitting there naked, tried to bite himself on as many parts of his body as he could reach. Um, in trademarks, uh, Vito Acconci produced works of visual art through a process that became a performance in itself by having been documented as such. Acconci's description of the performance states, quote, biting as much of my body as I could reach, turning on myself, turning in on myself, performance as locomotion across a boundary, connecting a region, absorption by one organization of a neighboring organization, self-absorption, bite, getting to a point, getting through a point, brand of performance, applying printer's ink to each bite and making bite prints, identity pegs, identifiers of a certain position I have taken at a certain time. Trademarks, title of the piece, September 1970, performance as the shaping of an alibi. <coughs> the bite prints can be stamped on various surfaces, paper, a stone, a possession, another body. Performance as, an, as opening a system, sharing a secret, end quote. The documentation of this event includes photographs of the naked Akanchi sitting on the floor and biting himself in hard to reach spots, as well as close-ups of the marks that he made on himself with his teeth, as you can see. As the description indicates, he also used the bite marks to produce prints by inking and stamping them on paper and other surfaces. You can see some of those as well. If viewed solely as a means of making prints, Akanchi's action could be seen simply as a highly eccentric studio practice, in which case it would be sufficient to identify the traces of his working methods in the resulting images. For example, the way the prints made from the bites clearly image the impression of teeth on skin. Right, so what I'm saying is basically he could simply have exhibited these prints that he made as prints. And one, you know, you could look at it, sort of try to figure out how they were made. Um, but instead, what he's done is he's also, in addition to doing that, made the process that produced these things into a work of performance art by documenting. When the action itself is recorded through written description, in which Akanchi clearly frames what he was doing as a performance, that raised issues he wished to explore about what can be achieved in and through performance, and photographs, as well as the prints of bites that are the action's artifacts, and presented to an audience as an object of aesthetic appreciation in itself, the act of documentation performatively frames his actions as performance. So this is a performance because it is documented as a performance. In order to better understand the performativity of performance documentation, we need to look more closely at what I originally called the act of documenting an event as a performance. This act does not consist simply of producing a description or an image of a performance. Photographers, for example, have been shooting theater, dance, and other performances in one way or another since the 1850s. But only a small and relatively recent subset of this vast store of images is understood to be performance documentation. The identity of a description or image as a performance document depends not simply on its subject matter, but on the circumstances and context of its production and what it is seen as doing, its performativity, in short. 
Performance documentation has a history. The idea of documenting performances, the thought that it was necessary to do so, and specific techniques of performance documentation all arose at specific moments. One of the archaeological sites on which to trace the emergence of performance documentation as a self-conscious practice is the New York art and performance scene of the mid-1960s, or really late 1950s, through the early 1970s. This scene encompassed a wide range of emergent art forms and styles, including pop art happenings, the beginnings of conceptual art, minimalism, process art, and so on. It also included the Judson Dance Theater and the countercultural underground theater identified with the Living Theater, whose members returned from self-imposed exile in Europe in 1968, the Open Theater, the Performance Group, and others devoted to collective creation. From this artistic ferment developed a particular way of thinking about the relationship between performances and their documentation. In choosing New York as the site of my excavation, this is the disclaimer, the necessary disclaimer. In choosing New York as the site of my excavation, I am not in any way implying that the particular evolution of performance documentation that I discuss is definitive. The decade that I have identified was crucial to both performance and its documentation, not only in North America, but also in the United Kingdom, throughout continental Europe, and in parts of Asia and Latin America. The story might be significantly different if it were to focus on a different scene. Nevertheless, it is particularly productive to pursue the question of performance documentation by looking at the New York art world in this period. This is partly because of the extraordinary amount of innovative and internationally influential artistic work in a broad range of forms that took place there, but it is also because of the presence on the scene of Michael Kirby, a sculptor, theater maker, editor, and academic who saw the New York scene as akin to the European avant-garde movements of the early 20th century and felt that the ephemeral work happening there needed to be preserved through documentation. Kirby was one of the first to practice performance documentation, beginning in the late 1950s with written accounts of happenings. For Kirby, the performativity of performance documentation lay in its ability to capture the disparate performance practices that made up the New York avant-garde, and thus to lend coherence to the scene. He also was one of the first to theorize, I think he may have been the first, but I can't be sure about that, to theorize performance documentation as a distinct and self-conscious discursive practice. In the discussion that follows, I will examine Kirby's ideas on performance documentation as an early theorization of the practice, and look at how his ideas resonated with those of others involved in the documentation of performance on the New York scene, including the photographers Peter Moore and Babette Mangold, the artist and anthologist Ursula Meyer, and the scholar Ronald Argelander. I will also discuss the relationship of performance documentation as conceived by Kirby to its most important historical antecedent, the practice of theater photography. In conclusion, I will return to the question of the performativity of performance documentation. So Michael Kirby came to New York in 1957 and saw firsthand all the new aesthetic alternatives that opened up in reaction to the dominance of abstract expressionism. He was a vociferous chronicler and theorist of contemporary and historical avant-garde who maintained a staunch commitment to the value of the new in art. He often compared artistic creation to scientific discovery and insisted, quote, in art as in science, it is the new that gives the field its significance, end quote. Kirby's book, yes, that is the one. Kirby's book, Happenings, published in 1965, is perhaps the first example of performance documentation per se, although he did not identify it as such. Kirby devotes his introduction to identifying some generic characteristics of the happening as a form and providing it with a complex genealogy in the historical avant-garde and the work of more proximate figures such as the composer John Cage and the dancer and choreographer Merce Cunningham. Um, this is an image from the book that's included in the book. Uh, it's uh, from a, a happening by Robert Whitman called The American Moon from 1960. So this is just an example of a piece of performance documentation that appears in this particular book. There is no direct discussion of the premises behind Kirby's approach and the book's form, but it is important that the book is subtitled An Illustrated Anthology 
It is presented as a collection of happenings rather than a book about happenings. Included in the anthology are scripts for happenings, statements and other texts by the artists responsible for them, textual descriptions of the performances, presumably by Kirby himself, who is credited as writer and editor, and photographs of performances and rehearsals, such as this photograph. You can see the audience in 1960 was kind of the Mad Men crowd. <laughs> <clears throat> Although Kirby's anthology of happenings was an early exemplar of performance documentation and his particular approach to it, as were some of the essays in his second book, The Art of Time, published in 1968, and possibly one of the ugliest book covers ever created, he did not theorize the practice in either book. This came a bit later in a series of overlapping essays published largely in the Drama Review known as TDR and later renamed TDR, the Journal of Performance Studies, a journal with editorial offices at New York University where Kirby was teaching when he assumed the editorship in 1971. In these essays, Kirby grounds the necessity for performance documentation in both the ephemerality of live performances and the often very limited access to avant-garde performance work. Quote, some important pieces are performed only once or twice to small audiences. Even those presentations that tour internationally cannot hope to have the attendance of the average commercial film." End quote. Although Kirby was editing a journal with a long history of addressing contemporary drama and theater, he redefined its brief more broadly to encompass the kinds of performance that would be regarded as early examples of performance art, such as happenings. In an introductory statement that outlined his editorial intentions, Kirby specifically identified, quote, TDR's interest in performances done by artists primarily involved in other fields, that is, not theater. The investigations of these interconnections and influences among the arts is another way to expand our view from drama to performance in general, end quote. He further states in another text, quote, notice that our concern is with performance as fine art. This means that we are dealing with only a relatively small area of theater. And Kirby always used the word theater to talk about any kind of performance. So when he says theater, he doesn't actually mean theater. Okay? He means anything performed, so to say. Uh, this means we are dealing with only a relatively small area of theater. Most theater is commercial art, involving a mass appeal to general popular standards." End quote. Kirby implies that because avant-garde performance <coughs> occupies so little space in a cultural landscape dominated by commercial art, it needs to be documented in order to have greater cultural presence. Mainstream performance does not require documentation. It can take care of itself, so to speak. But avant-garde experimental performance must be documented in order to be known beyond its negligible initial audience. And in effect, it must be documented to exist. Kirby's characterization of fine art performance as essentially a coterie phenomenon that could have greater reach only through documentation apparently was shared by some of the artists involved in the production of the performances, including happenings that he covered as a documentarian and editor. Clay Zollenberg, for one, whoops, sorry, jumpy finger, engaged a photographer, Robert McElroy, to shoot his performances. And you may have noticed that the photograph of Robert Whitman's piece that I showed you a minute ago was also photographed by Robert McElroy. Uh, and basically, Oldenburg hired McElroy to shoot everything that he did, okay? um, certainly suggesting some kind of desire for preservation. Uh, McElroy's photographs appear both in Kir Kirby's Happenings Anthology and Oldenburg's own book, Store Days, published in 1967, which documents Oldenburg's environmental installation of the store and the Ray Gunn theater performances that took place there, performances that were also filmed by Raymond Saroff. McElroy's photographs are joined in the book by scripts, texts, and drawings by Oldenburg related to the production of the five performances that made up Ray Gunn theater. Oldenburg includes the program for these events, reproduced in facsimile, which makes it clear that each one was performed only twice and by a different group of people each time. In a text titled Budget for Theater, which follows the program in the book and may be a proposal or a funding request 
or perhaps just a statement of purpose by the artist, Oldenburg stresses the small scale of his operation. Quote, these performances would occur one time only, with about 35 spectators each time. He also indicates that these performances were, quote, not so much directed at the general public as at other artists and connoisseurs interested in developments along this line, end quote. Nevertheless, it seems that he sought a larger audience for these coterie performances by documenting them in the book that contains this text. In arguing for the need to document performances, Kirby looked both to the present and the future. Documentation makes current work accessible to a larger audience and, quote, establishes a record for study in future times, end quote. Moreover, he stated, quote, a concern for tomorrow's past is one reason for documentation of contemporary performances. All current presentations will soon pass into history where they will be completely unavailable to direct experience. Anyone interested in theater history should recognize the importance of documenting significant contemporary works as completely as possible. So I want to draw your attention to two things in this quotation. One is Kirby's use of the phrase tomorrow's past to define the present. Okay, the present is tomorrow's past. And, and, and that is the objective of documentation, is to document what's happening now for the future, okay? not for now, exactly. Um, and then the second is his use of the word significant. You should recognize the importance of documenting significant contemporary works as completely as possible. Just hang on to that. We'll circle back to it some, at some point. Is, um, it is noteworthy that Kirby refers here to the present as tomorrow's past. This makes it clear that performance documentation was to be addressed primarily to the future, not the present. It was to be directed to posterity and the historical record more than current audiences and publicity. It was a means of making performances available to future audiences who would have no other access to them. From Kirby's perspective, the crucial task for performance documentation is to allow the reader of the performance document to experience the performance itself. Acknowledging that, quote, no information about an experience is the same as the experience itself, he nevertheless refers at one point to performance documents as creating surrogate performances, which I think is a lovely and, and provocative phrase. The document as surrogate stands in for the original event for an audience to whom that event is no longer available. In Kirby's version of surrogacy, it is the responsibility of the document to provide its audience with an experience as close as possible to that of the original event. This can be accomplished only, again, according to Kirby, if the performance documentarian recognizes that, quote, a concern with history demands an accurate and objective record of the performance, end quote. Kirby readily admits that complete objectivity is impossible, not least because of the inevitable selectivity of any account or image, but insists that it remains a worthwhile objective, quote, to the extent that a writer consciously attempts to record rather than to evaluate or interpret, the performance will retain its own identity and the reader will respond to the documentation in much the same way as he would have responded to the performance, end quote. So Kirby, I think, is to be taken seriously when he calls the you know, doc documents surrogate performances, because he really did believe that you know, a future audience could experience the performance, the original performance, from a documented form, as long as the document is an objective record of the event. That is the necessary condition that has to be met for this to work. Kirby's notion that documentation can deliver something like the same experience as the original performance goes against the grain of current ways of thinking about performance documentation, which tend to emphasize the futility of producing an adequate representation of an original live event. Nevertheless, his claim should be taken seriously despite its lack of qualification. There is no question but that the performance document becomes a surrogate for the original performance. And this goes back to the point I had on my bullet point slide 
that the vast majority of the audience for any of these events knows the event through its documentation, not by having been there for the original performance. Okay? So, in one sense, I would argue Kirby is absolutely correct. These documents do ultimately serve as surrogate performances. They do ultimately function as the means, in fact, the only means by which most people who have an experience of these performances have that experience, okay? So I take Kirby seriously because I think on a very fundamental level, he's absolutely right about what, how, how we use performance documentation, right? Um, we rely on documentation to provide us with information about performances that we have not seen, and we take the information to be about the performance, not the document, okay? Now this is, there's a lot sort of buried in that statement, which I'm not going to go into all of it. But what it has to do with, in part, is some people's claim that the document of a performance is a separate entity. It may be based on the performance, but it's really a different thing, maybe a different artwork that doesn't really tell us anything about the original performance. But I have never seen anyone, including myself, look at performance documentation and say, oh well, you know, like, like these photographs or whatever, and say, well, this tells me nothing about the original performance, but it's a lovely work unto itself. Never, right? Anytime anyone looks at performance documentation, they are doing so for the purpose of finding out about that performance, having some kind of experience of it, and coming away from it thinking they know something about the performance, not just about the document. So that's, that's, that's sort of packed into that sense. Many more recent commentators feel, along with Carol and Rye, that one danger of documenting ephemeral performances is that, quote, the record can all too quickly become a substitute for the live event it represents, a substitute that cannot provide evidence of exactly the thing it purports to record, end quote. As Matthew Reason points out, and Matthew Reason has written an entire book on performance documentation, um, he points out that this position is grounded in a paradox. The even essence that is said to be the defining characteristic of live performance, the fact that it disappears, is the very thing that prompts performance makers and others to want to preserve it through documentation. So on the one hand, we say the essence of performance is that it's live, that it doesn't exist anymore, which, on the other hand, we say, therefore, we have to document. The result is that we demand that performances be documented while simultaneously disavowing the connection between the document and the original performance, as in Carolyn Rye's statement that uh, you know, no documentation can provide evidence of exactly the thing it purports to record, and yet we still want to document. Um, although Kirby's approach may be reductive, it avoids this paradox. Kirby treats performance as ephemerality not as its essential defining characteristic, but rather as a limiting condition that prevents avant-garde performance from having larger audiences and greater historical and cultural presence. He implies that the value of preserving performance for future audiences trumps the value of respecting its ephemerality. Waterfall. Okay. Kirby's faith in objectivity is also controversial from the current perspective, since we are now used to thinking of documentary objectivity as chimerical, and recordings or documents as necessarily reflective of their creator's biases, if only in terms of what they include and exclude. It is important, however, to understand that the crucial opposition for Kirby is not that between objectivity and bias. Rather, it is the dichotomy between two discursive practices that he sees as opposed. Documentation on the one hand, and criticism, as in theater criticism, on the other. In a passage I quoted above, Kirby contrasts recording performances to evaluating or interpreting them, and strongly favors the former approach over the latter two. As Martin Puchner has shown, Kirby imposed his desire for, quote, a precise, descriptive, and analytical style on TDR during the period in which he edited it, which does not make for the most delightful reading. 
Indeed, Kirby's call for objectivity in performance documentation is one manifestation of an implacable hostility toward criticism to be identified with evaluation or interpretation that recurs throughout his writing. In one essay, he refers to, quote, theatrical criticism as a kind of intellectual and emotional fascism that imposes opinions and value judgments on its subjects and victims, end quote. Anybody out here write theater criticism? <laughs> In Criticism for Faults, his most sustained statement on the subject, Kirby dismisses theater criticism as, quote, unnecessary, as well as being naive and primitive, arrogant and immoral. It should be eliminated, end quote. Although Kirby offers detailed arguments in support of this claim, they need not concern us here. What is important is that he explicitly contrasts criticism with performance documentation, which he sees as embracing positive values that are antithetical to those of the critic. Quote, performance is ephemeral. It disappears from history unless it is recorded and preserved somehow. Thus, a concern with history demands an accurate and objective record of the performance. To the extent that the record is complete and detailed, the performance can be reconstructed mentally. That's the surrogate performance. Values will take care of themselves. Since everyone has values, they will evaluate the historical reconstruction. If they have accurate and exhaustive information, their evaluation will approximate the evaluation they would have made of the actual performance if they had been in the audience. But history does not care whether its data is liked or disliked. It is built only on the quality and accuracy of the data itself, end quote. The, oh, sorry, it's not the end of the quote. Thus, a fifth and final claim can be made against evaluative criticism. It tends to work against an obscure, vital historical documentation. So I think what he's basically saying is that theater criticism or anything that expresses an interpretation or evaluation of a performance documents the interpretation or the evaluation, not the performance. Right? And what is needed are things that document the performance so other audiences can access the performance through the documentation. And inevitably, because people all have values, they will evaluate the performance as they reconstruct it mentally. But it shouldn't have been done ahead of time for them, so to say. Kirby's hostility toward criticism finds support in Susan Sontag's well-known essay, Against Interpretation, of 1964. Well, <laughs> I mean, the title pretty much says it all. Against Interpretation, in which she characterizes criticism, you thought Kirby was vicious. She characterizes criticism as, quote, poisoning our sensibilities with effusions of interpretations, end quote. Sontag focuses more on literary criticism than on the visual arts or performance, but a number of her points anticipate Kirby's. One of Sontag's objections to interpretation is that, quote, it makes art into an article for use, end quote, rather than something to be appreciated in and for itself. Kirby's definition of art includes the stipulation that works of art have, quote, no objective or functional purpose, end quote. As we have already seen, Kirby shared Sontag's distaste for critics who would seek to impose their views on the work and its audiences. In practice, both favor description over interpretation or evaluation. Sontag first proposed that critical writing needs to switch its object of attention from the content of works, which is subject to interpretation, to their form, for which we need, quote, a descriptive rather than prescriptive vocabulary, end quote. Still better, she suggests, would be, quote, acts of criticism which would supply a really accurate, sharp, loving description of the appearance of works of art, end quote. Although it seems unlikely that Kirby, who often wrote in the detached style of an analytical observer, would have embraced Sontag's call for, quote, an erotics of art, end quote. I may be doing him an injustice, I don't know. It is apparent that both strongly favored a descriptive approach to writing about art over an interpretive one. Although Kirby's position on performance documentation is tendentious, and his expression of it frequently intemperate, he was not alone in believing that art should be presented as objectively as possible rather than critically. For example, Ursula Meyer's well-known anthology, Conceptual Art, which overlaps Kirby's field of interest through the inclusion of documentation of performances by Vito Aconci, Dan Graham, Bruce Nauman, and Dennis Oppenheim, reflects similar assumptions about the nature and purpose of such a book. 
Meyer's claims regarding her approach to assembling the book parallel Kirby's call for using the printed page to make the artwork itself as directly accessible as possible. She argues that, quote, conceptual art is best explained through itself, end quote, and goes on to say that this book is not a critical anthology, but a documentation of conceptual art and statements. Critical interpretation tends to frame propositions different from the artist's intention, thus prejudicing information, end quote. The book's design reflects the effort at direct and objective presentation of information. The index consists of alphabetized list of an alphabetized list of artists, last name only, in block capitals, and the pages on which their work appears. So you can see the basic style from the cover uh, with uh, the word conceptual art repeated uh, in the block capitals. This is a, a typical uh, thread from the book where you have an image, you know, a piece of uh, visual documentation and then some kind of uh, verbal description. Uh, the verbal text can be, are uh, usually by the artists themselves. They're, they're not other people's descriptions of, of their work. Each work is represented by, uh, by text written by the artist and photographs where appropriate. Although Meyer offers some definitional generalizations about the nature of conceptual art and its historical placement in her introduction, much the way Kirby does in the introduction to Happenings, the rest of the book is given over to artwork unadorned by further commentary. Although presenting unadorned information about art in the context of conceptual art, which itself often takes the form of unadorned information about art, is arguably different from doing so in the context of happenings and other performances, the intention to use text and photographs as much as possible to give the reader a direct experience of the artwork, documented with as little critical intervention as possible, underwrites Meyer's project as much as it does Kirby's. And uh, there are also certain other connections between Meyer and Kirby. They were both sculptors. They, they showed in some, of the, in some of the same exhibitions and so forth. Kirby's quest for objectivity determined not only the way he felt descriptions of performances should be written, but also how he felt they should be illustrated. In Kirby's view, performance photography should rely on the, quote, mechanical and therefore objective, end quote, aspects of photography rather than its potential for expressing the subjectivity of the photographer. In this respect, he clearly participated in the long history of understanding photography as primarily a mechanical process rather than an artistic medium. This, by the way, was the reason why photographs originally could not be copyrighted under US copyright law, because it was thought that they were produced by machines, not by people. And copyright, things, things that can be copyrighted have to be definable as works of authorship. And the, the feeling was that the author of the photograph was the camera, not a person. And therefore, it could not be copyrighted. Obviously, that has changed. Um, Roland Barthes off-quote a description of the photograph as a denotative message without a code from his essay, The Photographic Message, first published in 1961, is another significant point along this trajectory, though arguably this is a reductive reading of Barthes. The work of two prominent performance photographers active in New York during the period under consideration, Peter Moore and Babette Mangold, and this is Peter Moore, constitutes a documentary practice that aligns with Kirby's project. Beginning in the early 1960s, Moore captured images of happenings, Judson dance theater performances, Fluxus events, and many other kinds of avant-garde performance. Excerpts from an interview with Moore were included in an essay by Ronald Argelander that was published in TDR in 1974 under Kirby's editorship. Theorizing the use of photography to produce performance photo documentation, Argelander echoes Kirby in many regards. Two of the purposes that Argelander ascribes to photo documentation are to allow those who do not see the performance to experience it and to serve as a record for historians. So this is very familiar. Also like Kirby, he opposes documentation to criticism by contrasting photo documentation to the work of photographers whose selection of moments to capture from a performance, quote, is based primarily on their taste or aesthetic judgment accusing such photographers of adopting, quote, a critical attitude toward the performance, end quote. These photographers are photo critics rather than photo documentarians. You didn't know there was such a thing as a photo critic, did you? 
The idea that the photo documentarian's purpose is to record, is to produce a record of the event as untainted as possible by personal biases or preferences is taken up by Moore, the photographer. I have always dissociated myself completely from making any critical comment conspicuously in a photograph, end quote. He and Argelander further emphasized that a photo document of a performance is a record of the performer's work, not an artwork by the photographer. Moore compares performance documentation to reproducing static artworks, because he also worked as an art photographer, primarily photographing sculpture. And he, uh, he um, sort of associated photographic performances with photographing sculpture. He says, there is a similarity in approach to documenting sculpture and documenting performance. What you're trying to do is to do justice as much as you are able to, to the intent of the artist, rather than impose your own point of view on it. And again, this is what Ursula Meyer says about her presentation of conceptual art, for example. Much of his conversation with Argelander and Argelander's own ruminations concern technical issues that the photo documentarian must address, including what kind of cameras, lenses, and shots to use. Argelander asserts that, quote, photographers who shoot only close-ups and medium views are not photo documenters, end quote since the idea is to capture as much of the performance as possible and to remain faithful to a spectator's visual perspective. This perspective is necessary to produce images to function as the surrogate performances for which Kirby calls. The idea of documenting performances in photographs does not emerge from Argelander's article as purely unproblematic, however. One of the issues that comes up can be called the problem of the iconic image. In the interview, Moore and his wife, Barbara, point to the way performances come to be represented by a very small number of published images, or even a single image, which Barbara Moore describes as a self-perpetuating misrepresentation, since the publication of certain <coughs> images increases interest only in those particular images, which become divorced from the performance as a whole while simultaneously representing it. That's her view. Barbara Moore mentions Yvonne Rayner in this context. Two of the many other performance artists whose work has suffered this fate are Robert Morris and Carolee Schneemann. Their collaborative performance, Sight, from 1964, which was photographed by Peter Moore and also by Hans Namath, another very famous art photographer, famous for having taken pictures of Jackson Pollock painting, um, is generally represented in print by only two images, one of which has re been repeated so often that it has become the iconic sign for the whole performance. The same is true for Schneemann's Interior Scroll of 1975, which has long been represented by a single photograph by Anthony McCall. Now, I want to pursue a tangent for just a second, because while it is important to point out that the reduction of a performance to a single still image is clearly problematic, so is the assumption that a single still image cannot adequately represent a performance. Consider the following passage from Matthew Reason's book, in which he discusses the work of the photographer Lois Greenfield. Quote, it intrigues me, writes Greenfield, that in one five hundredth of a second, I can allude to past and future moments, even if these are only imaged. I think that's a misprint. I think it's supposed to be even if these are only imagined. In this manner, the images are interesting embodiments of Henri Cartier-Bresson's thesis that by capturing the decisive moment, the still photograph can be representative of the missing whole. They also match what Anthony Snowden describes as the ambition of his theater photography to, quote, sum up a moment more than that moment, end quote. Here, the decisive moment seeks to lead the viewer into contemplation of movement reading a narrative of time into the still fragment. So perhaps still photographs aren't necessarily that still. Uh, this issue was also at the heart of the only, to my knowledge anyway, the only court case ever brought under the US copyright laws, um, uh, clause about copywriting choreography. The only case that was actually brought under that clause was against someone who had published a book of photographs of Balanchine dances. And the argument was that the photographs, even though they were still photographs, 
infringed on the copyright in the choreography. Right? So at least somebody thought that still images can represent movement right? and represent time. Um, so this is not a simple matter. <laughs> It's not simply a matter of saying, you know, somehow thinking, oh well, I'm, got, I'm sort of preparing for the next part of this, but, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily a, a moving image captures performance or aspects of performance that still images cannot, right? Um, okay. And just as a little, I just sort of threw this in. Um, this is a film. I showed you a, an image earlier of a still image from Robert Whitman's The American Moon. This is a film that Robert Whitman made of one of the performances of The American Moon of the same moment that I showed you in the photograph. It is a silent film. This is also interesting too though. I, I don't think this is part of the original footage. I think it's something he added later. But the idea that he was documenting in order to have some kind of, of means of recreating the performance and that he was already thinking this in the early 1960s is, is, is very suggestive. Okay, and if you like a side-by-side -side comparison, here it is. This is Robert McElroy's iconic photograph of the event, and here's Robert Whitman's film of the event. Same moment in the event. I am not telling you what conclusion to draw from this. Okay, so turning from Peter Moore to Babette Mangold. Babette Mangold came to the New York in the early 1970s. So, in other words, she started working as a performance documentarian about 10 years after Peter Moore. Um, and photographed avant-garde theater and dance, especially Trisha Brown and Yvonne Rayner. This is one of her single most famous photographs. Uh, and performance art, uh, she belongs to the generation that came to the age of the 1970s rather than the 1960s. She retrospectively describes her work as a performance photo documentarian in terms that closely parallel Kirby's and Moore's. She writes of going to one of Richard Foreman's theatrical productions in 1970, quote, what I saw was extraordinary, but only four other people were there to see it. Therefore, recording it was an absolute necessity. Somebody had to preserve it for posterity, end quote. For Mangold at this time, quote, photography was not about passing judgment. On the contrary, it was about absolute objectivity. The justification for shooting the photographs was solely that they should exist. How the photographs would be used was left vague because they were made for others who would make sense of them, if not now, then sometime in the future. Making the work visible for my contemporaries was not my primary purpose. To these ends, she developed an approach to shooting performances meant to foster automatism, shooting very quickly, and giving as little consideration to choice of shot and camera setup as possible. Quote, getting it was better than missing it, even if technically it wasn't a good photograph, end quote. Kirby's sense of urgency around the need to document the performances happening on New York's art scene and his emphasis on objectivity and the preservation of performances for future audiences find sympathetic resonance in Moore's and Mangold's descriptions of their respective photographic practices. Mangold, who was trained as a cinematographer in France before coming to the United States, points out that the quality of the early video technology available to artists, and we're talking here basically about the Sony Portapack, the first consumer level portable video equipment available, which I believe became available around 1971 or two, uh, and was immediately taken up uh, by artists. Uh, but the quality was not good enough to show fully what had gone on to an audience that hadn't been there. More interesting is her discussion of why she documented performances in still photographs and chose, with very few exceptions, not to use film or video, despite her background in film and lack of training as a still photographer. Her argument is that photography could be more automatic and spontaneous, and therefore more objective than filmmaking. Quote, Photography was immediate and reactive. 
Film had to be preconceptualized before shooting, end quote. Whereas Mangold felt that a reasonable degree of objectivity in documentation was attainable through photography, she also felt that to render a performance in an audiovisual medium was inevitably to produce an adaptation of it rather than a record of it. Quote, a series of photographs could provide a chron chronology of the iconography of the piece, some sense of the maker's intentions and aesthetics, and therefore be informative and worthwhile. Film was almost doomed to fail if you couldn't restage the action for the film camera, and that was needed to make an interesting film work. If I had to summarize the essential differences between film and photography in documenting performances, I would say that for better or worse, the motion picture camera can mislead while the still camera can be mute, end quote. Well, so what she's basically saying, which I've heard her say on other occasions, is that inevitably a film of a performance is a film adaptation of that performance. It is not a document of the performance. It's not a transparent means by which to access the performance. It is a movie, okay? And, and that there's no way around that as far as she's concerned. Mangold explicates her resistance to the idea of using film or video as means of documentation in ways that align with the values that Kirby espoused. As we have seen, Kirby's concept of performance documentation is grounded in a straightforward ontology. Performances happen and documentation preserves them in forms that will allow future audiences to experience them. Because these documents present the performance as objectively as possible, future audiences will be in a position to arrive at their own interpretations and assessments, much as they would have had they seen the original event. From Kirby's perspective as an early theorist of performance documentation, the relationships between the performance and its documentation and between the document and its future audience are clearly defined and uncomplicated. Over time, however, it has become clear that the reality of performance documentation is considerably messier than Kirby's fairly cut and dried approach suggests. Mangold, in some of her recent work as an artist rather than a documentarian, addresses the complexity and untidiness of performance documentation. One of her contributions to the exhibition, Art, Lies, and Videotape, Exposing Performance, a title that all by itself suggests some issues, uh, which was at the Tate Liverpool a few years ago, um, was an installation juxtaposing her well-known photograph of Trisha Brown's roof piece, which is this, with the contact sheet showing all the black and white shots that she took of the performance. You don't see that here. What this is, facing the photographs were video monitors showing the three reels of color motion picture film that she also shot that day, which were originally projected as three images side by side. In the installation at the tape, the glow of the monitors reflected in the glass <coughs> over the photographs, creating a forced contrast between still and moving image, color and black and white, isolated moment or more complete record. Mangle raises questions but provides no answers. She leaves the viewer of her installation to sort out the relationship of these multiple modes of representation to the absent event and the question of how or if a single static image documents an event that unfolds in time. It is important in this context to contrast the approach to the visual documentation of performance represented by photo documentation to other practices, particularly those of conventional theater and dance photographers. This is partly because theater photography is the most significant historical antecedent to earlier performance documentation and is the practice in relation to which performance photo documentarians implicitly or explicitly define their own. It also returns us to the premise that performance documents can be understood as performative utterances. To paraphrase Austin, this is a matter of doing things with pictures. As I suggest in the introduction, to make an image of a performance is not, is not simply to record its occurrence. It is to bring the event into being in a particular way. It is therefore necessary to consider what theater and dance photography does and to compare and contrast these doings with those of performance documentation. As David Mayer has shown, theater photography became a regular practice from the late 1850s on. However, these early photographs were, quote, not intended as images of performance, end quote. Rather, they were images of performers that participated in the tradition of photographic portraiture. 
If these portraits appear to depict scenes from plays, and this one, it's not exactly a scene, but it is Joseph Jefferson in, in character. Um, the scenes were simulated in the photographer's studio. The primary function of these photographs was promotional, but because the photographs themselves were considered collectible commodities, their marketing function was complex. Quote, the portrait photograph marketed the play and the performer, and the play and the performer marketed both the performer and the photograph. Anyway. The photos were thus intended exclusively for consumption by a contemporary audience, with no view to preserving the events for future generations. After 1901, photographs of actors were taken on the stages on which they performed, but generally during specially arranged sessions, for which the actors would strike poses from specific moments in the play rather than at actual performances. This is called a photo shoot, sorry, a photo, what is it called? Any actors out here? Um, photo call, I used to be an actor, I used to do this stuff, photo call. Uh, a practice that continues to this day and that Argelander decries as misleading. Early photographs of stage plays were themselves theatrical in the sense of being staged and simulated rather than documentary in ambition. These images would be posted in theaters to serve as advertisements and previews for the performances on offer. It is worth noting that the founding procedures of theater photography that Mayer describes have remained firmly in place in a variety of contexts, though not always for the same purposes, for more than a century. For example, Martha Graham collaborated with the photographer Barbara Morgan between 1935 and 1941 on a series of images eventually published in 1941 as a book titled Martha Graham, 16 Dances and, Photog and Photographs. The photographs in the book reproduce moments in Graham's dancing. However, they were not taken during performances, but were shot in Morgan's studio under exacting technical conditions, quote, designed to capture the most profound and most crucial moment of the dance, unquote. Morgan did not photograph full performances. Rather, Graham repeated specific movements, such as this one, until Morgan felt that she had achieved the images she wanted. Asked many years later, this is a great quotation, I think, asked many years later about whether her photographs were intended to recreate performances, Morgan retorted, hell no! I paid no attention to the stage. I wanted to show that Martha had her own vision that what she was conveying was deeper than ego, deeper than baloney. Dance has to go beyond theater. I was trying to connect her spirit with the viewer to show pictures of spiritual energy, end quote. Morgan considered her images not as a means by which a viewer might experience Graham's performance, but as distilling the truth of Graham's dancing, implicitly and interestingly suggesting that her carefully posed images could get closer to that truth than photographs of actual performances, which are inevitably compromised by the baloney that surrounds performances as social interactions. Morgan suggests, in fact, that her carefully staged studio images convey the underlying spiritual truth of Graham's dancing in a way that no photograph of an actual performance could. The early 1970s saw a resurgence of interest in theater photography on the hills of the notoriety of an underground theater scene populated by the Living Theater, the Performance Group, the Open Theater, and other groups engaged in the various forms of collective creation that resisted or eschewed theater's traditional relationship between text and performance. Books documenting such productions and photographs and texts that appeared around this time include Dionysus in 69, the Performance Group from 1970 with photographs by Max Waldman and Frederick Everstock, Waldman on Theater, a collection of Waldman's work, Paradise Now, Collective Creation of the Living Theater, with photographs by Gianfranco Montaigne, and Alice in Wonderland, The Forming of a Company and the Making of a Play, with photographs by Richard Avedon and text by Dune Arbus. I have another one just because I love it. This is, of course, a double page spread in the book where the photograph continues across the spine. As Natalie Crone Schmidt observes about this work in an essay published in 1976, this renaissance of theater photography reflected an emerging theater aesthetic in which the essence of the production was thought to lie not in the script being performed, but in the performance itself. Quote, theater reveals an increased concern with process rather than product. The plays may have no ongoing life apart from their performance. The dramas existed in their processes, 
the momentary personal interactions of actor, role, and audience, which the script does not express, but which the photographer can capture." End quote. For an increasingly visually oriented theatrical avant-garde, that is visually as opposed to literarily, photography seemed to provide a more meaningful record than could the written word for, quote, the photograph records the language of silence, end quote. Although Schmidt makes a compelling case for seeing these photographs as participating in the new theatrical aesthetic that they also record, it is equally important to emphasize that they maintain continuity with the tradition of theater and dance photography sketched here. For one thing, both Avedon and Waldman, this being Avedon, shot the performers in their respective studios, not in performance, seeking to recreate striking images from the productions in a manner akin to Morgan's work with Graham. Avedon and Waldman were also portraitists, some of whose subjects were actors, sometimes in character in Waldman's case. Both works worked, <laughs> both worked largely in close-up or medium shot, the shots Argelander consigns to the photo critic rather than the photo documentarian. In these respects, their work is completely continuous with the history of theater photography and at odds with the ambitions of performance documentarians like Moore and Mangold, with whom they were contemporary. As Mayer says of the earliest examples of theater photography, these are images of performers, not performances. Avedon's and Waldman's images are performance performers as seen by a particular photographer at a particular moment. Schmidt defines the aesthetic of the 1960s theatrical avant-garde as emphasizing momentary personal interactions and argues that Waldman's photographs do the same. Quote, he interacts as audience member and the photo can express that interaction and provide then one spectator's experience of the performance, that person's sense of what it was like to be there. Waldman's photograph then is a record of an interaction, not of the play in itself." End quote. Waldman's emphasis on his own subjectivity, at least according to Schmidt, rather than the performance itself, runs directly counter to Moore's and Mangold's respective efforts to avoid subjectivity in their performance photography work, marking the difference between his theater photography and the kind of performance documentation that Kirby, Argelander, and others were conceptualizing at the same time. Discussing the role of spontaneity in Waldman's carefully composed shots, Schmidt notes that the photographs make us, quote, aware that Waldman might not be able to get a picture quite like that again, end quote. In other words, the spontaneity at issue is not the performers, but the photographers. And the theater photographs of the early 1970s often say more about the photographer than they do about the performance, capturing the photographer's engagement with the event rather than the event itself. Morgan's earlier images of Graham were not as directly about the photographer's subjective experience of the performance, but they were about photography as a means of accessing an aspect of Graham's dancing that ostensibly could not be accessed through the theatrical experience or its direct representation. Although these photographers certainly produced images of performers and performances, sometimes performers from the same avant-garde circles as those photographed by Moore and Mangold, their work is quite distant from the self-conscious aspiration of performance documentarians to produce objective, self-effacing records in words and images that could serve as means by which future audiences might access the ephemeral performance itself. Having presented a brief, but I hope fairly full picture of the efflorescence of the idea and practice of performance documentation on New York's experimental art scene, I return to speech act theory to propose a more refined concept of the performativity of performance documentation than I suggested at the outset. To enrich my analogy between documentation and speech acts, I will enlist John Searle, one of Austin's successors, who made the salient point that while all utterances in their performative aspect exert force on the world, I should just say parenthetically, if you read the book, How to Do Things with Words, what you eventually realize is that Austin sets up this distinction between constitutive utterances and performative utterances only to eventually show you that there is no such thing as a constitutive utterance. All utterances are, in fact, performative. Um, and what Searle does is he comes in and says, OK, but they're not all performative in the same way. And so he starts making a taxonomy 
of how different kinds of performativity that, um, that different kinds of performative utterances can accomplish. Um, well, so Searle made the point that while all utterances in their performative aspect exert force on the world, they do not all do so in the same way or with the same type of force. He therefore proposed a taxonomy of illocutionary acts, which is the word that substitutes for performative, illocutionary. Searle distinguishes declarations from other performative speech acts, primarily in terms of what he calls the direction of fit between words and the world. Some illocutions have as part of their illocutionary point to get the words to match the world. Others to get the world to match the words. Assertions are in the former category, promises and requests are in the latter, end quote. Declarations are distinguished by their, quote, dual direction of fit. Quote, while the words of a direct declaration do, in some sense, fit the world, they also constitute it so that by their very utterance, the world is also made to fit the words. Okay. Um, well, Searle's dual direction of fit provides a valuable heuristic for thinking about the world-making abilities of performance documentation as envisioned and practiced by Kirby, Moore, Mangold, and others. With respect to performance documentation as a discourse, Kirby clearly wanted the words to match the world, literally, in written documentation, metaphorically, in photo documentation, in that he wanted documentation to produce as objective, literal, and accurate a record of the performance and event in the world as possible. But the practice of performance documentation that Kirby envisioned was also world-making. Searle points out that declarations required the authority of an extra-linguistic institution, not just linguistic competence, to be successfully performed. Kirby's status not only as an artist active in both the visual art and performance scenes in New York, but also as editor of TDR, a well-established and respected journal, and as a professor at New York University, provided the institutional authority that endowed the documentation that he published there with illocutionary force. Discussing Kirby's editorship of TDR, Puchner defines his project as that of, quote, creating a contemporary avant-garde in New York, end quote. By documenting disparate performance practices by visual artists, dancers, theater makers, and others in the same pages, the journal brought the New York-based avant-garde that it sought to describe objectively into being as a coherent scene. Simultaneously, it helped to create a discursive category of performance that transcended individual genres and art forms, but implied an overall experimental attitude and membership in an avant-garde. As both Kirby's focus on tomorrow's past and Mangold's statement that she was photographing so that an unknown future audience might better understand the work documented suggest, performance documentarians created an archive of significant work whose significance was asserted through the act of documentation rather than established prior to documentation. These works were not documented because they were significant. They became significant because they were documented. Certainly, Kirby and those who participated in his project considered the performances that they documented to be significant. But as we have seen, they undertook to document them largely for a future audience and could not have claimed to know what that audience would find to be significant. Whereas Kirby believed that the availability of objective records of these performances would allow later audiences to make their own determinations about them, the reality is that the availability of these performances in documentary form is a major reason that later audiences have found them to be significant. In these respects, performance documentation brought the world it described into being through its own declarations. Thank you for bearing with me.